Welcome everyone to tonight's presentation on spiritual warfare. We are so glad that you could join us. Let's open in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank that we could uh, be together and learn more about how we can combat spiritual warfare. As we look at scripture that speaks directly to spiritual warfare and how we look at experiences of those that have been in spiritual warfare already. And also how we can look at the, the steps to freedom in this battle that we, we are facing. And also that uh, encourage all the believers to stand firm in the word. We thank you for the presenters. We thank you for John. We pray for continued protection on this technology. And we love you. And we thank you for all that you do. Bless this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I would love to, to tell everything about all of our presenters, but I've really kind of done the cliff notes. I hope to honor them all because they're all really wonderful Christ followers. Patty Minahan is our first presenter, and she lives in uh, Spokane, Washington with her husband, Terry, and they celebrated their golden anniversary last summer. They have three grown children and seven grandchildren. She's a retired social worker and school, uh, school teacher. Um, she did uh, have a stint for a brief period of time after she came out of retirement at, I think she told me the age of 50, and she, she worked for Alaskan Airlines as an airline attendant. And she left there as pretty much a supervisor of new flight attendant hires. Um, she's very passionate about volunteering She's been a school board member. She's been on hospital boards. But more importantly, she has served the Lord with her life. She uh, and Terry love small group discipleship and mentoring others to become fruitful disciples. She's been involved with Freedom in Christ for almost 30 years. And she currently serves as our Northwest Director of Ministry Relationships. Jewel, our second presenter, Jewel uh, Westphalen, and her husband, Brian, live in Knoxville, Tennessee. She was first introduced to Freedom in Christ ministry just prior to serving in what is now known as Crew in a high school ministry in Moscow. Now, that's pretty amazing. During that same time, the Lord sent a lot of other missionaries, missionary kids, and uh, Russians to, to she and Brian seeking to get unstuck from various spiritual entanglements and conflicts. After going through the steps to freedom in Christ, she and Brian became more secure each individually, but also as a couple. And it was so timely since they were living in very challenging circumstances. She's been a full-time field staff for Freedom in Christ ministry for over 20 years. She currently serves as the Southwest Director of <laughs> Prayer for Freedom in Christ Ministry. Craig Bass lives with his wife, Caroline, in Waco, Texas. They've been married for 24 years. Craig is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Craig, thank you for your service. We have a son-in-law who's a major in the Marine Corps. Um, Craig has served on staff with churches and missions agencies. He leads discipleship ministry. Craig has been helping pastors, missionaries, and church leaders work free, uh, walk free from personal and spiritual conflict since 2007. Currently, Craig is the national director of leadership development for Freedom in Christ Ministries. And our final presenter, Sue Jantz, and her husband, Warren, live in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. They've been affiliated with Freedom of Christ Ministries since 2015. They were initially introduced to the ministry of Freedom in Christ in the 90s through the teaching of Dr. Anderson and their pastor, Mark Kubek. Sue has served the Lord full time with crew as a, a teaching leader for BSF. She's been the mom and prayer state coordinator. And Sue is currently our National Director of Prayer for Freedom in Christ Ministries. So we want to welcome you all and thank you all for, you know, just talking to us and sharing with us your personal experiences on spiritual warfare and what you've learned through them. So 
without any further uh, interruption from me, I would ask Patty that you begin. Well, thank you so much, Lori. As Lori just shared, I've been involved with Freedom in Christ since 1993. So 30 years, that's really a long time. And I appreciate how clearly the truth of God's word is presented and how clearly it changes lives. I just can't tell you how many women uh, and small groups I've led through the steps over all these years, many, that's for sure. And in each of those steps appointments, we'd be naive to think there wasn't a spiritual battle going on. To be prepared to face those battles, we must know scripture and be ready to stand firm. And our daily battles too. I'm not just talking about um, a, a steps appointment. Ephesians 6, 10 through 19 reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Or put it this way, take up the shield of faith which stops everything Satan can throw at you. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador. We all need to know these verses. An encourager certainly needs to apply these verses. We do not facilitate a steps appointment in our own strength, our own wisdom, but in the truth, the power and the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ directed by the Holy Spirit. The truth is truth. In a steps appointment, we are not involved in a power encounter, but a truth encounter. Freedom in Christ uses the analogy that comparing the power of Satan to the power of God is like comparing an ant to the atomic bomb. Think about that. I remember in the early 90s, while we were preparing for Neil Anderson to come to a conference, we were living in Spokane then and now in retirement, we've moved back. But we spent a whole year as um, the, a leadership team preparing for Neil's conference to come to town. Ron and Carol Wormser trained a lot of us to take people through the steps. During that time, I remember being a little bit overwhelmed once in a while and wondering if, if uh, something happened in a steps appointment that I didn't know what to do, uh, how would I handle that? Like if, if somebody had multiple personalities or if they, um, if they were being really oppressed demonically, uh, how, you know, what would I really know what to do? And I remember Ron and Carol saying, you're not in charge of the appointment, the Holy Spirit is. So you just ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and it'll be all right. Well, God showed me that so clearly in the very first time I did a steps appointment. I'm gonna call the gal Susie. Susie, in the first few minutes, kicked out the prayer partner, said, he, said uh, she had to go. And then she looked at me and her eyes rolled back in her head and her body went stiff as a board and she slid out of her chair and was unconscious flat on the floor. And for a few seconds, I got scared. And then I thought, oh no, you don't. And I just said, Holy Spirit, you are in charge here. Holy Spirit, we, uh, you, you alone are in charge here. And then I said, Susie, who do you serve? And I had seemed like I had to say that dozens of times, but who do you serve? 
and she opened her eyes and she said, I serve Jesus. And I said, then get back in your chair and let's get to work. It turned out that her grandmother was a Satan worshiper and had assigned a spirit guide um, to Susie as a little girl. And even though Susie had become a Christian later in her life, she didn't realize this voice she was used to listening to was from the enemy. So the deception was just a powerful thing there. And I'm sure that all of us have come across people while we're mentoring or encouraging, maybe taking them through the steps. We've come across people who have believed the lie, right? So our focus is to, to help people walk away from those lies and say, oh, Lord Jesus, I only want your truth. So as the enemy attempts to hijack a steps appointment or any part of a person's day, simply and calmly, but with emphatic strength, claim the truth. Quote scripture, don't be fooled or bullied. Kick the enemy out. And very importantly, have the inquirer take a stand with God's truth and in the strength of Jesus and command the enemy to leave. Give the inquirer some verses, some that we'll, I'm sure we all for today will be sharing verses with you. So give them verses to, uh, to use as resources and challenge them to find more on their own. You won't be with the inquirer after they leave a steps appointment. They need to know how to stand in truth without you. John 1, uh, 1 John 3, 8 says, Jesus came to undo the works of Satan. James 4, 7, submit to God and resist the devil. As Christians, each of us has to assume our responsibility to stand against our enemy. 1 John 5, 18, I am born of God and the evil one cannot touch me. We have great examples on how to take a stand against the enemy in the prayers and declarations of the steps booklet. These are truths not only to use during a steps appointment, but anytime the resources are needed. From page four, there's a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are present in this room and in my life. You alone are all knowing, all powerful, and every, everywhere present, and I worship you alone. I declare my dependency on you, for apart from you, I can do nothing. I choose to believe your word, which teaches that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to the resurrected Christ. And being alive in Christ, I have the authority to resist the devil as I submit to you. I ask that you fill me with your spirit and guide me into all truth. I ask for your complete protection and guidance as I seek to know you and to do your will. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. That prayer is followed by this declaration. In the name and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command Satan and all evil spirits to release their hold on me in order that I can be free to know and choose to do the will of God. As a child of God who is seated with Christ in the heavenly places, I declare that every enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ in my presence be bound. God has not given me a spirit of fear. Therefore, I reject any and all condemning, accusing, blasphemous, and deceiving spirits of fear. Satan and all his demons cannot inflict any pain or in any way prevent God's will from being done in my life today because I belong to the Lord Jesus. Last week, I was taking a gal through the steps who developed a horrific headache during the session. And um, she, she just was determined, I was so proud of her, to just stand firm and to renounce that headache and just kick it out. And she worked her, right through it and the headache left. And she was able to uh, just find amazing victory in, uh, in, in her life. And it just delights me because she's a licensed mental health therapist. And I'm excited for how she can take that message then and share it with so many of her clients. Also in our steps booklet, just this is a wealth of resource, right? Um, the statements of truth on page 10, oh, there are so many, and you're familiar with it, I'm sure. 
each one is um, re uh, referred to the scripture from the Bible. So I, I'm just going to share a few of the key ones that tie into our, our spiritual warfare battle and our victory through the Lord. I recognize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. I believe that he came to destroy the works of the devil and that he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public display of them having triumphed over them. I choose to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I put no confidence in the flesh for the weapons of warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of strongholds. I put on the full armor of God. I resolve to stand firm in my faith and resist the evil one. I believe that apart from Christ, I can do nothing. So I declare my complete dependence on him. I choose to abide in Christ in order to bear much fruit and glorify my father. I announce to Satan that Jesus is my Lord. I reject any and all counterfeit gifts or works of Satan in my life. I believe that the truth will set me free and that Jesus is the truth. If he sets me free, I will be free indeed. I recognize that walking in the light is the only path of true fellowship with God and man. Therefore, I stand against all of Satan's deception by taking every thought captive in obedience to Christ. I declare that the Bible is the only authoritative standard for truth and for life. I believe that the Lord Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he is the head over all rule and authority. I am complete in him. I believe that Satan and his demons are subject to me in Christ, since I am a member of Christ's body. Therefore, I obey the command to submit to God and resist the devil, and I command Satan in the name of Jesus Christ to leave my presence. As we go through the steps, we are seeking guidance from the Holy Spirit as to where the person has believed lies from the enemy, accepted counterfeit as truth, turned over places of his or her life to Satan knowingly or unknowingly. As we seek the truth, the light of that truth quickly shuts out darkness. Each believer has a personal responsibility to choose to obey and to live in harmony with Jesus and his word. There's a declaration on page 21 of the steps booklet that says, therefore, having submitted to God, I now by his authority resist the devil and I command every spiritual enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ to leave my presence. I put on the full armor of God and I stand against Satan's temptations, accusations, and deceptions. From this day forward, I will seek to do only the will of my Heavenly Father. Spiritual warfare is all around us. If you're sensing a non-Christian influence, don't try to get into any sort of power struggle with it. Our ministry, Freedom in Christ, stands strong in this fact. We facilitate a truth encounter, not a power encounter. Learn to recognize the enemy and don't let him stay around. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. Stand in truth, period. Speak it out loud and claim the victory Jesus Christ secured for us long ago. The light of God's truth quickly wipes out the darkness of our enemy. Old patterns, habits, strongholds can be hard to change, but the bottom line is this. Don't make it complicated and don't be intimidated. Christ won the battle on the cross and with his resurrection. As Christians, we're in him. He tells us in the Bible that we need to believe in and claim his power, his victory. In his name, we command Satan and any of his demons to leave our presence and they must go. We model that in a steps appointment and we teach the inquirer how to make that choice for themselves to daily stand strong. The battle's already been won. Claim it. Thank you, Patty. You're and welcome. we'll hear from Jewel. Thank you, Joe and Lori, for hosting this and um, even if I don't get to see you, it's a pleasure to have you join us here today. Uh, the, what we're talking about in terms of a steps appointment is a normal process of repentance that Neil Anderson put together 
to help people that are struggling or stuck or just want to get more clean before Jesus. Normally, it's a very calm, peaceful environment. Sometimes people get a headache or there'll be something else going on. But in most cases, it's a, it's a, it's a very calm procedure just to get right with God. If you don't, however, have a relationship with God, that would be the first step. So I wear, I'm aware that a lot of Freedom in Christ people are watching this. But in case others are watching too, we encourage you to go to our website, ficm.org, and hear how you too can become a Christian. Um, and I'm going to just model for you what we're talking about. God, I just consecrate this technology and the slideshows and the PowerPoint in the name of Jesus. And we just declare as children of God, we have authority uh, over technology and, and all the things that need to work in order to get this word out to people. In Jesus' name, amen. There it is. <laughs> I led a Bible study once and months later, the women that were in it said, the most important thing we ever saw you do was how you took authority when the DVD wouldn't work. So um, here we are. What I'm going to talk about briefly is um, the authority of the believer, worship as warfare, God is sovereign, the two hands of authority, and, and that God is God and we are not. I first, you know, Howard Hendricks was a, a beloved uh, professor of Dallas Theological Seminary. And once he said um, to a student, how are you doing? And the student replied, oh, I'm under the pile. And I don't know about you, but I can, I can sometimes feel that way too. But Howard's reply was, well, what are you doing under there? And I take heed to that even now, like, huh, maybe cir circumstances and the pressures of life don't have to weigh me down as much as I perceive. This month alone, um, I, I've encountered a number of difficulties. A board hit me in the head. What in the heck? Causing a little concussion. My phone, my husband's phone went dead when he was on a trip. My back went out. Um, attended and grieved with seven families who were grieving a loved one who had passed away. Um, and so some of this is just normal difficulties in life. Uh, was the board hitting my head spiritual warfare? I think so, but here's the deal. I can't always determine what is spiritual battle and what is not. I just have to take, know my identity in Christ, take my authority in him and move on. And that's my encouragement for you as well. Um, the first I heard from Josh McDowell, who spoke on spiritual warfare, it was in the early 1980s. And uh, it's a wonderful talk. You can find a lot of them online. But he, he pulls from Ephesians 1 and 2. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. This is in the Berean Study Bible. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of his strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So um, what Josh helped me understand was some of the Greek words for these powerful words that he's using is power and accordance with the working and strength and might. So power would be personal power. That would be the meaning of the Greek term there. Working would be um, energeo, which is activity. Strength is kratos, which is God exercising his great strength through us, and might, which is his great inherited strength toward us. So basically, it's talking about resurrection power toward those of us who believe. So if you've seen um, baptisms in church, um, frequently they will talk about how we are co-buried with Christ. So now moving on to chapter two in Ephesians. And so we were dead in our trespasses and our sins in which we once walked, um, chapter two, verse one, following the prince of the, par the power of this air. Um, and then jumping down to uh, verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. So we are co-buried 
with Christ, um, with him. And then verses five and six, he made us alive with him together with Christ. And then he raised us up with him. So you could say we are co-ascended with him. The part that I didn't see, didn't catch in all these baptisms is a fourth one that we are co-done with Christ. And that is that we are co-seated with him above all. This is in verses six. We're raised, seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. And so on my PowerPoint, I have a, a picture of a, a kingly throne chair. So I can picture, picture it with me. Um, God in the heavenly seated there, Jesus at his right hand after he ascended to heaven, and then me, my little old me, but just a child of God seated at the right hand of Jesus. What kind of place is that? It's a place of power and authority over all dominion. And so sometimes I think when we talk about spiritual battle, either people go, oh, that, that's not anything I have to mess with. That's some, in, some foreign country in Africa. I don't know why Africa always gets picked on. Or we get afraid and we go, ooh, that sounds scary. Instead, I think there has to be an awareness of it where we gaze at Jesus, but do glance at who our enemy is but also know that even though the war has already been won, I am seated with them in the heavenlies at the same time the battles today really matter. And it starts with us having our armor on and, uh, and being with him. So if I have trusted Christ's payment for my sins, who am I seated next to? Well, I'm seated next to the King of Kings. Where am I placed? At the right hand of the Father. What kind of place is it? A place of power and authority. Not our own power, but what we have inherited from the Lord God. And whose power is it? It is God's. And for what purpose? Well, so that in the, if you go back to um, uh, verse 7, so that in the coming ages, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. So with his blood, God purchased us that kind of authority. The next point I wanted to say is that worship is warfare. And so we are told in Ephesians just to sing and give thanks. Ephesians 5, interestingly enough, right before the chapter on spiritual warfare, sing and give thanks. In Psalm 8, it says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And you know, my, my friend with Freedom in Christ, when her grandson, a little toddler, unexpectedly died, she said that God convicted her that not only did she need to worship, but she needed to worship out loud. And I think I could take heed to that too. I can worship a little bit. I'm a little bit more of an introvert. And so I'm, I'm reading my Bible and so forth, but there's something about doing our worship out loud that is also reminding ourselves and the enemy who we really are and whose we belong to. So our job is to look up. This is the day that the Lord has made. You know, we're, we're going through a difficult time right now. We have a, a young adult daughter that has been bed bound or, and or housebound for over a year, 15 months. And so, but every day I would, well, just about every day, I would say, it's a new day, you know? And so we're not entitled to anything. God, who is sovereign, shows us that every day is a gift from him and we get to choose to be glad in it. So it doesn't mean that we're not honest with ourselves. You know, there's grief and loss, loss of health. You may be going through a time of sorrow or difficulty. And so we do get to talk with, like David did in the Psalms, about how, how, how maybe even angry with God or confused. Um, not sure how his goodness is going to be shown through this difficult thing. But an elder's wife once said to me, Jewel, I know that God sees your heart for praise. And I know that you, he loves how you're honest with him, like David is in the Psalms. I think the Lord would have you get to the praise a little sooner. <laughs> So she was so right. Like I can gripe and groan, but at some point I just need to say, you know what, God, I'm just going to praise you, even though I don't understand that right now. And the reason why we do that is because God is sovereign. 
He is so sovereign. And so I think I lean on that theology that I can trust him probably more than anything else. So in life, I don't get it. I can trust he's doing a good thing. You know, in John 10, verse 11, it says the thief might come to steal and destroy. But right after that, it says, but God is the good shepherd. So while we have an enemy infiltrating our homes, it's a very ner unnerving thought. Like I'm not one to run to battle. I'm just not that kind of person. But at the same time, if I know that I have a good shepherd holding me, caring for me, taking me by the hand and leading me, I can take comfort and take confidence in that. In James 5, it says, um, it's, um, it's talking about Job, interestingly. And verse 5, uh, 11 of 5, it says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And you know what stroke struck me? Job was steadfast in the trials. That means that even though he asked God some hard questions, there's an element that he knew that God, even in the trials, is still compassionate and good. Our God is sovereign. So I consider authority, there's a two-handed approach to it. The one, and it comes from James 5, it's probably one of the scriptures I quote more than anything else. James 5, 6 and 7, it says, but God opposes the proud. I don't know about you, but that gives me pause every time I think it or say it. Because I don't know about you, but pride still sneaks in there. Uh, thinking about others and, oh man, God really needs to get a hold of them. And God's like, how about you, Jewel? How are you doing? And so God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's humbling too. And then it says, submit yourself to God. So I take that as the first hand of authority. My job is to surrender to him because he is sovereign, because he's worthy of my praise. I get to um, choose to humble myself before him and do the hard work of forgiving the people that have offended me, do the hard work of um, repenting of the sins that um, I've stumbled into. Um, but then the second and Colossians 3, 12 to 17 gives some more guidance on the kind of character we get to put on with Christ through us. Um, but the second hand of that approach is um, to resist the devil. And honestly, in my church background, I'm a pastor's kid. I never heard anything really about spiritual warfare, let alone resisting the devil. But you know, Jesus, when he re resisted the enemy after fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, the Greek there is that it was a spoken verbal word. And so we, here we are instructed, submit to God, yes, but also resist the enemy and he will flee from you. I've seen some, some types of people only resist the enemy. They've not done the hard work of submitting. And I personally believe the enemy will just laugh in their face because they've given him room to operate in their lives. On the other hand, if we only surrender and submit, but never really resist the enemy, we may be making ourselves vulnerable as well. So God is still God and we are not. And because he's sovereign, we can trust him. So I personally believe that in spiritual authority, I'm only able to take it over what has been promised to us in scripture. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of promises there in scripture. For example, I know um, that he, God is opposed to division. So I remember a friend of mine, international um, director of prayer for Freedom in Christ, Clay Bergen, standing in our home and just saying, you know, when my kids were little, and my kids were little at the time, at the moment they were behaving, but of course kids are kids. And so he, Clay wisely said to me, sometimes I'll just stand against a spirit of division in the home. So I tried that in my homeschooling days. And when things, there was just contention and animosity, and I'm sure I was probably part of the problem too. And um, I would just stop, surrender to God, submit to him, resist the enemy. And the, honestly, frankly, my girls hated it when I did that. But honestly, frankly, within minutes, everything would simmer down. And so that is an area where I know that God wants us to walk in unity. 
Um, another example of that is um, my husband likes to do yard work. So he was helping an elderly neighbor. And through time, for some reason, she started falsely accusing him of taking advantage of her and really was incredibly disrespectful. And there was such, there was such a division between us. And I was in consternation about this because it's a neighbor. And where God tells us to, as much as it is possible, live at peace with others. And so uh, my husband was still um, upset about it. But after a few days, I decided that because she loved flowers, I'd buy her some cheap flowers. So I was honoring my husband, <laughs> but, but I was also giving like a peace offering. I gave her a little note and it had a sticker on it. As much as it is possible, live at peace with each other. And, uh, but just as importantly, I went on a prayer walk and I just said, enemy, you get out of here. This is not to be where we live with this kind of animosity and isolation and division from somebody that we generally care about. And after that walk, the flowers, the note, um, everything just melted away. It was just a good example to me that there's an unseen world and we get, you know, we get the privilege of participating in that through our prayers and taking authority in Christ. So I've probably gone over time um, in, in kind of a summary here, you know, get out from under that pile of circumstances. What are we doing under the pile? Get out from underneath there. And honestly, I would say one of the enemy's biggest tactics is a discouragement among God's workers. I'm seeing it right now post COVID with other ministers of the gospel. And so we get to stand against that, that tactic of discouragement. We are overcomers. We are victors in him. We have to remind ourselves daily um, for the days are evil. And because we are co-buried, co-raised, co-ascended, and co-seated with him in the heavenlies, we get to submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. So God bless. Thank you so much, Jewel. Now we'd like to hear some from Craig. Well, you guys have already heard, um, I think, from Patty, as she talked about the importance, the primacy of scripture. We need to memorize it. We need to know it. We need to be able to grab it. We need to be able to use it. Um, so that was powerful. And then stacking onto that, we have Jewel, who reminds us of the source of that power. Where are we seated? We're seated at the right hand of the throne of grace. Wow. And we are way above every principality and power. Um, that is important to note. Um, so Jewel also talked to us about um, submitting to God. And so let me just tell you my brief story. Um, I had served in the Marine Corps and like many that you may know who served in the military, uh, I had many unresolved issues from some very challenging experiences. Moved into the business world and I experienced um, two layoffs in technology. Um, they were both really well-paying jobs and uh, through no fault of my own, I was laid off. But as a young man, that that still you're still laid off. <laughs> and after that, I was like, you know, I'm the, I've had enough of corporate America. Uh, I can do my own thing, you know, go my own way. And so I started a company, uh, which I promptly um, drove into the ground and went bankrupt. And so I started a second company. And the same thing happened. I ended up in complete failure. So that's when my journey of depression and anxiety began. Um, and then I, I reached out to the medical community. I remember driving myself to the hospital because I knew nothing, I didn't know what to do. And I, I drove myself to the hospital and said, doc, I just don't know what to do. And they, they stuck three boxes in front of me, uh, some blue pills, green pills, and red pills. And literally just said, we know this will do something, but we don't know what, so pick one and we'll just send you on that journey. And they sent me off to a series of doctors. And for five years, um, I received disability income from my insurance company for um, depression, anxiety, um, and it just went further and further into a hole. Interestingly enough, God sent in those five years, five different people into my life who all handed me a book. You guys might know the name of that book. It was called The Bondage Breaker uh, by Dr. Neil Anderson. And like a, a good reader that I was, the first four books that I was given, I threw in the trash and said, I don't need this garbage. I've got my medicines, you know? Well, that wasn't doing me much good. Uh, but uh, God is so infinitely patient with us, isn't he? Uh, he really is. I know you guys have heard stories like this or your own story may resemble God's patience. 
Uh, and in his kindness, he sent somebody into my life to invite me to go on the Freedom in Christ course, uh, which at the time it was a 10 week course. Uh, we got to the end of it and the people that were running the course literally handed me you know, the book and just said, okay, take yourself through the thing in the back, which was chapter 13 or what is now referred to as the steps to freedom in Christ. And so I, I spent three days locked in my apartment um, and it took me three days to take myself through the steps to freedom. At the end of taking myself through, uh, through the steps to freedom in Christ, um, I felt a very strong impression from the Lord to write a letter to my insurance company and say, Jesus has healed me. Stop sending me money. And it was in walking out, renouncing an identity of being disabled and announcing the truth of who I was in Jesus Christ. I think Patty referred to the statements uh, in uh, our identity statements or truth statements. You guys know, know about the bookmarks and all of that. So as I began to announce who I was from the throne room of heaven and walk into the identity uh, and calling that God had given me, I began to get my freedom. Um, and just immediately began to help other people do the same. I launched a ministry to help other people go through the steps to freedom in Christ. So that's my journey from absolute brokenness to um, being a very productive citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So like Patty talked about, I utilized the prayers in the, in the back of Dr. Anderson's Steps to Freedom in Christ book, uh, as well as the declarations. I also began to accumulate uh, with experience and um, just time, uh, other prayers and um, tools that I could utilize in this battle. And I got healthier and healthier. And like many people, um, I know many of you are CFMAs or, or volunteers with Freedom in Christ Ministries, and you go through the Steps to Freedom on a regular basis, maybe three or four times a year. We on staff try to do that about four times a year. A couple times a year, I take myself through, and a couple times I have somebody else take me through. And that's part of that humbling myself, the submitting myself before God, which Jewel spoke of, which is so absolutely important. So what I wanted to just real briefly give you the message uh, is to stay alert. The attacks are going to come. And so, yes, I got my freedom. Yay. I mean, that's exciting. It is. And to be fruitful for the kingdom is awesome. The first Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Uh, and I suspect that every one of you has experienced attacks since the time when you experienced a measure of freedom. Uh, so you're walking healthy, you're productive for the kingdom, and yet things come along. Jewel described some, some attacks that, that were coming around in her life. We said, well, what is our responsibility here when we are under attack? And we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5. It says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So remember, our responsibility is to capture the thought. Now, I am a huge warfare prayer guy. I collect warfare prayers like other people collect hobbies. Uh, and I've got so many that I love. And I absolutely affirm Dr. Anderson's um, warfare praying. Uh, if you see in the back, uh, we have some samples in the Steps to Freedom for Christ. Um, there are some deeper ones. Uh, John Eldridge, for one, has written some really good prayers that are available free. Um, and it's one of his prayers that I pray uh, almost every day. And he, John just calls it his daily prayer, extended version. Because he says, sometimes you need just to pray a little bit more. And so I'm a systems guy. And as a practitioner of this, as both Patty and Jewel were talking about regularly taking people through the steps, I regularly take people through the steps. Just about a month or so ago, um, I was in a great place. I had listened to a couple of hours of sermons. I mean, y'all know the time. You're just like, everything is going great. You're feeling fantastic. Life is good. Uh, and then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, with no real reason, a dark cloud came over me. You guys know about those dark clouds. Uh, this one, however, was unlike any I had experienced in 15 to 18 years. And it was all encompassing. I knew, so I had the, I had the thinking to know, okay, something's wrong. I, I'm under attack. And yet, somehow you just, I let it absorb, you know, and, and wash over me. Um, so what I'm describing took place in about a four hour period of time, but it was waves of depression, tremendous anxiety, a multitude of thoughts running through my head, 
which, um, you know, I'm cognitively going, okay, this is an attack. I know it's an attack. And yet what I'm hearing is close enough to truth to make me really begin doubting uh, and to become, begin to despair. And, and in fact, some of the thoughts I was hearing in my head were, you know, you can't tell anybody about this. I mean, you know, you're on the national leadership team of Freedom in Christ Ministries. What would people think if you said, I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I'm fearful, which were all the things I was experiencing. In fact, I began to experience in, that, in those moments and in those hours, suicidal ideations. So the full gamut of this stuff came on me. This is just five or six weeks ago. Um, so as a systems guy, I'm like, okay, I know what to do. This is an attack. I don't know why the enemy has the ability to do this. And I sort of start thinking, okay, what have I done? Have I done my word for prayers? Yes, I've done my word for prayers. Maybe I need to do them again. So I pulled out some of my longer ones and I read through them and I'm, you know, get to the end of it. I'm like, okay, great. Everything's going to be good, but it's not. I'm in that dark place and nothing has happened. No change whatsoever. I'm miserable. So like a good person, I just wallow in it for a little bit longer, you know, literally go and lay down. And then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still in the battle. I'm trying to hold on. And I recognize, okay, I need help. I need to reach out to the body of Christ. And that was when those lies were coming at me. You can't tell anybody. You can't tell your donors. You can't tell your, you know, ministry partners. You can't tell other staff members, you just can't, tell, you can't say anything. Um, but what I want to say to you guys is the attack is going to come and you've got to push through that. So I reached out and tried texting a few people. Hey, I really need prayer. Well, nothing changed. And so I, I realized I'm going to have to talk to somebody. And so I, I started calling and I called and I got a hold of somebody and I said, I'm just really depressed and I need you to pray for me. That's it. That's all I said. And the person prayed for me. In this case, nothing happened. You know, there, there are some things that we're working on that are just mysteries. We don't understand. The attack that I'm describing, Dr. Anderson would call it an intrusion. To my knowledge, because, you know, I've spent several weeks trying to analyze this, there was not, as Jewel talked about, a legal reason that the enemy had against me that I was aware of, something that was in my authority to, to fix or to repent, to confess, to turn to God. And yet the attack came. So I picked up the phone and called somebody else. And then they prayed for me and nothing happened. And then I picked up the phone and I called somebody else. And I did that five times. I had five different people pray for me. And in fact, all of them were volunteers with Freedom of Press Ministries. These are experienced warfare people. They know what they're doing. These are not just somebody that doesn't know what they're going to do. They prayed powerful prayers over me. Um, and all I can say is when the fifth one prayed for me, it was as if a light switch had flipped on. I had been in a total dark room and now the light's there. Or as if I had been underwater and now I was bone dry and all things were, were great. I mean, it's a rainbow day. Everything's great. I'm back to that great place I was at the beginning of this four-hour journey. So what am I saying here and why am I saying it? What I want to challenge you guys with is this understanding that you will in this ministry come under attack. It may be something you can do and you can get on your knees and repent of it and cancel the ground the enemy's gained. And it may be something of, you know, like an attack of intrusion where you just can't find the reason the enemy has a legal right to come against you. But for some reason he comes. And what I want you to hear is that you need to be able to humble yourself and say, I need help. You need to fight. You need to fight. When you can't fight, somebody else can fight for you uh, because the battle's already won. And what we're dealing with here is just lies or something that can come and make us feel awful. Um, I did not take any of those thoughts as truth. I knew I was under attack. I had the cover. And I think you will know as practitioners, you're going to know you're under attack. The principle I want to say is what can you do now in advance of the attacks that are going to come to prepare for that day? And so my challenge to you is to begin to ask the Lord, who are my intercessors? Who are my prayer partners? Who are the people that I could call and reach out to? And I would suggest to you that it would be important for you to go ahead and start praying with those people now ahead of the attacks. Develop personal relationships. When I called these five individuals, I didn't have to say anything. We'd already prayed together so many times. I just had to say, I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm under attack. I need you to pray for me. And then I shut up 
and let God do some work on my heart through those people as they spoke what they, what they felt to speak. So that's my challenge. Um, recognize the tax coming. Remember, you need to humble yourself. You need to ask for help. We are not designed to walk in this ministry uh, or in anything in kingdom building alone. We walk together uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ. So find your team, ask the Lord for wisdom on how to develop a prayer team, uh, and then be willing to reach out and say, I need help. Craig, thank you very much. And thank you for giving us all permission to understand that no matter what earthly position we hold, uh, when we are under spiritual attack, we need to reach out to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So thank you very much. Sue, we're going to have you finish up for us. This is our National Director of Prayer for Freedom in Christ Ministries. Thank you very much. So a big thank you to all of you for being on this Zoom call tonight and, and to Patty, Jewel, and Craig for just sharing so powerfully how we fight our battles. So where the Lord has led me to share is about the battleground, um, where the spiritual battle takes place. And when the war is lost on this particular battleground, we see the carnage of broken lives. So the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. God knew that we would need this constant reminder. So he reminds us many places through scripture about the importance of the love of God. John said, just as a father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Jude said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Paul prayed that we would be rooted and grounded in love and that we would know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Paul said that it was the love of Christ that constrained him or controlled him. Jesus exhorted the church at Ephesus that though they had good deeds, they had perseverance, and they dealt with false teachers, they had lost their first love. Malcolm Smith writes this about the love of God. Now in this moment, you are the focus of the passionate and unconditional love of God. He loves you with his entire being. You have all of his love as if you were the only human in existence. And he loves you because you exist without reference to your behavior. Understand and live in that reality. And behavior will change in response to such infinite love that leaves us worshiping in wonder. As John says, we love because he first loved us. Now, um, so like this is the main thing, like any good thing, and because this is the main thing, the war for the love of God is opposed. John writes in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Our love is, must be guarded because we cannot trade it for treasure. Like the advertisement for a wedding dress shop that said, love him, but love your dress more. There is an ever present temptation to love something else more than Christ. The enemy of, attempts to paint a caricature of God. And from that flows caricatures of our friends and family and even our ministry partnerships that keep us from love. Perhaps you've heard accusations that God is unjust or that he is unkind or even cruel. Maybe you've heard you can't please God or that he cannot be trusted because your prayers were unanswered. Here are some questions that are found under a free resource on the FICM USA website that might uncover some of the hidden places where we need to take a bath in the love of God. When I have to trust God, I feel the one thing I'm afraid God will allow or do is I seem to get angry with God when because our earthly fathers and mothers and even other childhood authority figures were designed to give us a view of our heavenly father, there may be some unraveling we need to do to to have to knit together a true view of who God is. Paul said, I count all things to be lost 
in view of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, because to know him is to love him. This great tool that we have in our Freedom in Christ course and in the Grace course is called My Father God. And I encourage you as you go through that tool to take some time with some of the statements of truth. For example, it says that God is intimate and involved with our lives. So where have you seen God be intimate and involved with your life? God is kind and compassionate. compassionate. Where have you seen God be kind and compassionate in your life? I'd encourage you to write down what comes to your mind as you work through these statements in our Father God. Chuck Sundahl said, thoughts disentangle themselves through the lips and the fingertips. So is there a place when you read through the statements in the Our Father God list that the words just kind of stick in your throat? Bring those to Jesus and ask him where he was in those times and wait for his response. God is the revealer of hidden things. Is there a hidden place where I'm unbelieving about the love of God shown in the character of God? I recently taught the grace course, and that was the question I was asking him. Lord, be the revealer of hidden things. God led me to an ungrieved loss in my life. Ungrieved losses can lead to the shutdown of emotions, at least the deepest and truest ones. Without realizing you, your grief and sad emotions go into your body, and they can trigger things like tiredness and depression and anger. For me, recognizing the ungrieved loss was triggered when I heard a pastor speak who shared how he was invested in the life of an unborn sibling who died shortly after birth, and the lights went on. As my husband walked through the room, he said, that was you, and I started crying. I knew my own story, and I had no, know that I had not grieved the loss of my sister who died one day after her birth when I was three years old. I wondered what I had believed out of the death of Elizabeth Ann. And so I asked God, and he answered, you believed I was mean and cruel, and that a mean God would snatch away something good and make it bad. That made perfect sense to me. Throughout my life, I had struggled with pop-ups of God snatching a blessing and, and making it a heartache. Is there an unexpected gift of money? Well, that must mean an unexpected costly illness. Is there a trip to anticipate? That could mean a car accident or a flight crashing. And then there was the flip side, the truth. God, I announce the truth that you are loving, protective, and gentle. And I spent some time there. Where was God loving, gentle, and protective in this short little life? Well, Elizabeth Ann is now in his presence. He was protective that she didn't have to suffer long in this life. He was gentle that he held her little life in his hands and walked her home to be with him. He was there at the gravesite with me and he wept too. But the best news of all is I see Elizabeth Ann again. So is there a hidden place in your life where you're unbelieving about the love of God shown in the character of God? Because life is hard and suffering is promised, we need God to be our balm of Gilead when we have believed less about him. Is there a place of surrender from false expectations of God that are keeping you from his love? Paul Bilheimer writes in his book, Love Covers, the most convincing proof to the world that agape love is supreme. It's not that we are always delivered from hardship, affliction, poverty, and suffering, but that none of these separate us, not only from his love for us, but from our love for him. Is my refusal to wave the white flag of surrender keeping me from experiencing the love of God? What have I learned about spiritual warfare prayer? The battleground for the love of God is where the battle originates. And so I want to just close by praying a prayer for you just about um, knowing the love of God. Lord Jesus, I just pray for each person on this call. I pray that they would know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. Lord, I pray that they would love you with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. And I pray that you, Lord God, would direct their hearts into your love and to the perseverance of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Thank you so much, Patty, Jewel, Craig, and Sue. Now, we do have time for questions. We can get started with one of the questions. Um, and it was touched on before about children, spiritual warfare with children. But how do you really deal with spiritual warfare when it involves children? Would somebody like to take a shot at that, please? I'll go. Um, Thank you. Not that I'm an expert. <laughs> Uh, one of our daughters, when she was very young, um, and this is common for young children, they ha she had night terrors. And by the way, if you haven't seen it, there's a new Stories of Freedom that's out the podcast on a story of exactly uh, that, night terrors. I haven't heard it yet. But anyway, um, and there were some other fears that were going on. And so she hadn't inv individually accepted Christ yet. I'm talking age three or four. But we knew that Christ's presence was with her. She'd been prayed for before she was born. And so we just taught her even at that age to call on Jesus. Jesus helped me. Um, of course, we did it for her if she couldn't talk at that moment. But um, just training her, Jesus helped me and I stand against the bad angel. Usually that, that really made a difference. And so that's one example. Another example was uh, we were staying... Um, away from home at the beach somebody had let us use their place and as we normally do we had prayed over the place dedicated it to the lord even though it was a christian couple we just do that by it because we don't know what's occurred there before but our other daughter was really acting out and, and she was normally submissive and sweet and it was just so bizarre and um and she was even doing some really bizarre behaviors like you know biting her arm or trying to pull out, out her hair and it we just couldn't quite understand it and so after a couple of days of this we put him to bed and um we sat on the couch and you know i'm thinking man we're gonna pray this through and you know um god's gonna show my husband that it's probably his fault and um and so i kind of presented that idea to him and that didn't go over very well so we ended up doing an adam and eve thing like this is your fault it must be your sin in your life and that was not our our best moment but we did have a book that um, i like to use with children called um, raising lambs among wolves it's by mark mark bubeck that sue mentioned and i'd happened to bring it with me and so i um we looked through there it's just a book of of spiritual warfare prayers for this, what we were dealing with is some rebellion or something. And um, through just sitting on the couch, reading that silently, God very specifically showed us how not only are we to submit to God, but we are to submit to each other. And we were not obviously doing that. And so we, you know, repented of that. We apologized to each other. We took our authority and we had our daughter back within less than a day. So again, the power of submitting and resisting. Could you talk a little bit more about intrusion? I can speak to that briefly. <laughs> intrusion is just a descriptor. It, it's a word. Basically, the enemy has a legal right based on something we have done. So we've opened the door or he doesn't. And if we, if we perceive in our mind, if we've gone through our system, if we're like, man, I've checked everything. I've asked the Holy Spirit. I can't think of, I have not discerned. I have not found a way uh, where the enemy has a legal right. You know, example, unforgiveness or something like that, or, or some type of generational door that might be open through, um, you know, perhaps um, Masonic Lodge or something like that. If, if we can't discern, discern something, then we call that intrusion. And it just means intruding. The enemy is intruding. Um, one way of thinking of that is this idea that, you know, there are, there, there are demonic assignments, however those come about, but some demonic force is com coming over the wall. It's coming over the barriers of protection because whatever pain it may have to experience uh, is going to be so bad, it just, it's going to ignore the boundaries that you have. Now, the beauty is, as we've, as our presenters have already said, we have authority over that. Uh, in my story, it just took me a little while to figure that authority out. And in that case, it was getting some other people to, to pray for me, and they cut it off. So, hope that answers. Okay, great. Thank you, Craig. What are some things that we most frequently forget about spiritual warfare? What do we take for granted? We don't even think about it's happening, and we just 
kind of pass it over quickly, but there are certain things that we should be very much aware of regarding spiritual warfare that we should, we are forgetting at the time. I think sometimes um, we don't realize we're listening to the wrong voice. And so, you know, it's just getting in practice to recognize a voice that's out of harmony with Christ, recognize that quickly and quickly stand in truth. So again, having some of those scriptures ready to pull in or just to say, oh, oh no, you don't enemy. I renounce that, get out of here and, and then refocus. But I, I think that um, he's so sneaky, our enemy, and he can slip in there and, and bring in that discouragement or those, those lies or just all, all kinds of things. So recognize it quickly, I think. I would add to that too, that even as long I've been doing something with freedom in Christ now for 30 years, that I still kind of forget to put my armor on like daily, like it slides off if I'm not intentional about doing that. I'd rather just kind of glide along in my comfortable life and then, whoa, you know, a reminder to put, to really actually intentionally put my armor on. We are at war and uh, we have the privilege of standing for Jesus in that war. Sounds right. Amen. Amen. Well, we do have another question. Um, how did you decide to talk about the love for God as being the primary battleground, Sue? Um, well, you know, I was thinking about this today, even um, just like we have in our elections, we have battleground states, you know, we have places where the fierceness of the battle really comes in. And it, it just made sense as I was praying about what to present that because this, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength, that that is going to be um, the primary battle ground um, where the battles take place. And then out of that flows um, you know, different battlegrounds and relationships and ways we treat others and ways others have treated us. So that's, that's kind of how I came to, came to this. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, have a question. Could each of you share what you consider to have been your perhaps most challenging spiritual battle? There was a time, um, maybe health things that came up, um, maybe with my husband or um, back in 2005, I had uh, ovarian cancer, uh, but God healed me of that. And it just was, um, I don't know, a time, my greatest spiritual battle. I, right now there's a gal and she wouldn't mind that I'm using her name. There's a gal I'm trying to help whose name is Lisa. And she is just under such, um, such a spiritual battle. And she, she only gets it in little minutes every now and then, and then she slips back in. So uh, honestly, I think personally, maybe the, um, my toughest things had to do with health needs in okay. within the family. And then currently it's trying to to help someone I, I have grown to love and care for so much. I want her to be free. She's not. <laughs> so that's really a struggle. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Lori, I would, I would suggest that one of the longer battles I've experienced has to do with this rhythm of rest. Because what we get to do and watching God set the captives free is so exciting. It's like, yeah, yes, can I have some more, please? Yes, can I have some more? We, we dive into it. We want to be around it. We want to help people because we get to watch Jesus do his work. And it's a wonderful, exciting work. And yet, we are not careful if we are not diligent and we do not rest. We do not force ourselves to rest. Then we burn out. Um, and so I think that's a rhythm that I have struggled with over and over and over. I just keep coming back to that cycle um, of depletion. And so I would just say, please find a way to have a, a better rhythm of rest than I have had. 
Thank you, Craig. Anyone else on their greatest spiritual battle? Because we do have another question. I think I would say, as I ended my part of the presentation on, is um, is when you feel disappointed or discouraged. I'm thinking of a couple of disciples that really found a great amount of freedom. And then during COVID, or I don't, I'm not sure what the circumstances were. Um, I've, I've just, one of them I've been able to see because I'm on social media with her, um, or really dabble in things that are not of God. And I love her like a daughter. And some, some disciples you become friends with. And so uh, she's talked about going through the steps to, again, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to just jump into that. I'm, I'm not, not as punishment, but just as a discipline to not see the steps as a fix. Um, another one has cut off communication with me without communicating why and moved out of state without saying anything in our mm -hmm. whole group. And we had really been with each other all through COVID. And we had, she had said like, I think we're gonna be lifetime friends. And so that's disappointing. And then a difficult one just recently, also disappointed that we were make, spent incredible, Lori and I, incredible amount of time really doing the warfare with her and she was making great progress. And then things unfolded in such a way that um, the husband got upset about it and called us a cult and hacked her phone and cut off communication. Mm -hmm. So um, you're like, ah, oh, she's come so far. But honestly, I would say trusting a good God because we're not the savior. Mm -hmm. And so a good God, no matter where anybody lands can take care of his own. He really cares more than we do. So that's where I land on that. The discouragement and disappointment can be very real. Thank you, okay. Jewel. Thank you, Jewel. We have a uh, comment here, and maybe you folks can uh, uh, add more to it. My daughter recently revealed to me that she's been listening to voices from the time she was a child. This is something she never told me. She said the voices are getting louder, and now she is at the point where she doesn't want anything to do with God. Everything you have shared with me tonight has been very enlightening, enlightening and helpful in my prayers for her. Any other suggestions or insights that you folks could lend to this comment? Has this daughter ever uh, voiced the, her, her own salvation? When she was younger, yes. Okay. okay. So, and would she be open to, if not reading... Um, one of the little books like Restore, if would she be open to hearing it online or if you if this was laying around, would she pick a it up? Actually, I'm glad you said that because actually when I um, left her last week, because that's when I found out, uh, God had put it on my heart to give her the books. Um, and Craig, you mentioned about the bondage breaker mm -hmm. and throwing it out. I looked at my bookcase and I had to laugh because I have one, two, three, I have four copies that have been given to me over the years, but um, they weren't, two of them were given to her and two were given to me. And I think I actually have five because I got one when I did the Freedom in Christ uh, training. Um, and he put it on my heart to give her that book um, for her to, to, to read. So um, the bondage breaker and just, you know, just say, hey, that one and the one on anger because of Dr. Anderson, did one on anger because she has challenged, she has struggles with anger. Right. Um, and so to give her those two books and he said, whether she throws them away or keep them, he said, it's not up to me. He said, just be obedient and, and give it to her. So, yeah. yeah. And I think tell her that it's not unusual. Lots of people hear voices and they just yes. need to um, take authority over that. And well, that's the thing, trying to tell her, she keeps telling me I need to, cause I even had to go to counseling. She's never even told her counselor. She's been going in and out of counseling for years. Um, cause she's, um, she's been dealing with uh, a bipolar. She, well, she said, she thinks she's bipolar, dealing with depression and anxiety. She talked to her dad who said, mental health runs through the family. I know and see it for what it is, but she won't receive it from me. She's receiving it from everybody else because every time I mention to her about the voices about her getting delivered, um, she gets angry with me. And then um, she's like, you're not listening to me and I, I can't talk to you anymore. So when I do try to talk to her, one of the things, and I guess I'm not supposed to get afraid, but I do fear that when, if I push her 
and you know, Holy Spirit, thank God for the Holy Spirit because he tells me to, to back off, when to back off. Um, if I push her too hard, then she will close down and she won't talk to me. So I won't know, you know, what's going on, how to pray. But one the wonderful thing I love about God is no matter where she is, as I pray for pray for her and I pray for her every day, that God always reveals to me what's going on with her because he awesome. either shows it to me or she tells me. And I find out from something that she's doing or something that uh, she says, he reveals it to me. And then I immediately take it to him and say, okay, Lord, how do you want me to pray for um, her in this regard? So he has been doing um, that for me, but this is where she is. Um, and as you said, you know, I, I have a, I, I, I know God loves me beyond a shadow of a doubt. I tell people all the time, there is no shame in my game, Craig, because I told people in a minute, I messed up. I dropped the ball. I shared with them one group about how I got angry with the staff members at a meeting and I blew up and I was like, where did that come from? I had one of those moments you had. It was a wonderful morning, wonderful time with the Lord, great start to the day. And that just, everything with the plot that day. And, um, but one of the things I always tell people, I have to be honest, because if I'm not, then that allows the enemy to hold me in bondage. If I'm not honest about who I am and the mistakes that I made. Yeah. One of the things I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves me. And I know that whatever mistakes that I made, I, I'm grateful and thankful that I can come boldly unto the throne of grace and obtain grace and mercy to help in time of need. That I can yeah. humble myself before him and say, God, forgive me, I messed up. And I always get a picture of him standing there with his arms wide open saying, come on in my ba my girl, I got you. I love you, my daughter. Um, let's, let's work this out. Um, and I know these things beyond a shadow of a doubt, but I also trust to know that regardless of what I see, and I do get discouraged, but when I do at that moment, I say, God, I do not, um, I'm not gonna be moved by what I see, feel, or hear. I choose to stand on the word of God. You love my daughter and you said your desire is that all men will be saved. And I trust and believe that you will deliver her and she will be set free. And I, I tell him that every time. Thank you, Donata. Thank you, Donata. Does anyone else have a word for her? We can certainly all and will pray for you and pray for your daughter. Pray for your daughter. Indeed. We, there, was, yeah. there was a girl that um, I, we were doing a Freedom of Christ conference at a, a Christian college, and there was a girl in counseling for suicidal thoughts, and she was willing to meet with me and the counselor, and then last minute decided not to. And I said, mm -hmm. can I just pop my head in the door? And the counselor said, sure. So I put my head in the door, and I just looked at her, and I just said, not everything that you hear is from God or even yourself. And she just looked at me shocked, like I had been able to see into her head to see that she was hearing voices. And then I left, I honored her request. And so I get, I, we are all, all of us feeling for you, Danette, because Thank that's you. a tough, tough place to be. And I get you walk mm -hmm. a precarious line of not saying too much. You can pray mm -hmm. for another messenger. Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage you though, like every one of your prayers God says you're righteous in him and everyone is powerful Thank and you. effective. And that's where the battle takes place. Mm -hmm. I personally do like raising lambs among wolves as a, as a, as a prayer resource mm -hmm. in praying over my kids, even as adults. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. We're about running out of time. I want to thank the presenters for being so faithful, for being so transparent as well. Wonderful to hear the experiences that we all kind of share in some form or fashion. So thank you very much for, for being here. We hope that you've been blessed. And we are taking a break for a couple months. June and July, we will be off. But then in August, we will have our National Director of Ministry Relationships, Seth Broadhurst. And he's going to give us his elevator talk. And I'm not going to tell you any more about it in hopes that, that you'll become curious yeah. enough that you'll join us yeah. for that talk. Come on back and visit us. God bless you God all. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you.